Good evening and welcome once again to Grace Church's Wednesday in the Word. I'm Pastor Steve Eden and if you're part of the Grace Church family, welcome. It's good to uh, see you or at least connect with you. If you're connected with us from beyond Grace Church and just part of a uh, spiritual family that way, well, welcome. It's good to have you here on this Wednesday night. On Sunday mornings, we've been going through the centrality of Jesus. We are relaying Jesus Christ as the foundation of everything we are and everything that we do. Of course, we began looking at knowing his person. You know, as a, as a Christ follower, we want to be more than just a church member. We want to be a disciple of Jesus, a student of his. So we want to know his person. And then we've gotten into knowing his work. And we looked at uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. In the reason the Son of God was made manifest was to destroy the works of the devil. And that's kind of where we've been the last couple of weeks. So, Father, we thank you uh, for tonight. We thank you for this time together in the good word of God. And, Lord Jesus, apart from you, we can do nothing. So we invite you now into our scripture reading. Would you enlighten us, Lord? Would you, would you reveal once again the truth of who you are, your scripture, uh, Lord, your your word, your spirit, reveal it, clarify it to us, but Lord, also through us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I mentioned the second part of 1 John 3, 8. The reason the Son of God was made manifest was to destroy the works of the devil. So as we've gotten into knowing his work, the first couple of sessions, we were looking at that Jesus came to reintroduce the kingdom of God to us by putting the Spirit of God back in us that he might extend his Father's loving, redemptive rule, uh, his glory, fill the earth through us as his uh, uh, Spirit-born children who are reflectors of his image and his DNA. And so that's kind of where we started. If you've missed the fact, and it's funny, I've had people start coming to me now, they're shocked You know, they hear us talk a lot about the kingdom of God. This is the gospel Jesus preached, is the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God. And now they're starting to find it all through scripture, all through the gospels. That's the way it should be. So that's why we spent a couple of weeks on that as the first one. And then the second thing Jesus came to do is destroy the works of the devil. And I shared with you, if you eat that word, 1 John 3, 8, the second part there, the word devil is diabolos. And it means this in the Greek, a slanderer an accuser. Uh, He's one who comes to condemn in order to sever a relationship. So think about it. If Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, of Diabolos, then Jesus came to destroy the enemy's slanderous assaults against us. He came to uh, destroy the accuser of the brethren, and then he came to destroy the one who came uh, to condemn us in order to sever our relationship with God. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 2 real quick. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise, Jesus, shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. And of course, that is separation from the life of God. That is the devil. So the enemy had power in order to separate us because of sin and the fall in the Garden of Eden. But Jesus came to release those who through fear of death, fear of separation, because we felt guilt and shame and all those things, we were all our lifetime subject to bondage. Jesus came uh, to eliminate, to do away with the devil and his uh, onslaught in regard to convincing us that we were separate from God. And, guys, we were, until Jesus Christ, the last Adam, came and made everything right. Now, before I get too far uh, into that and continue on, I want to throw back out Luke 6, because the Lord just reminded me of this. I think it's very important. Luke 6, 46, we started Sunday morning with this. Listen, why do you call me Lord, Lord, Jesus said, and don't do the things that I say? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I ask you to do? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he's like. Listen, he's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the floods 
arose, the stream beat vehemently against the house, and it couldn't shake it. It was unshakable, for it was founded on the rock. I want you to notice there, the Lord showed me this Sunday morning early, that in digging deep, okay, it's not just finding nuggets of truth and wow, that's really deep. No, digging deep with Jesus is when you do what he says. When we hear what he says and then do it, he said, I liken that to a man who dug deep and laid a solid foundation. And why is this important? Because again, this is what this entire series is about when we're talking about the centrality of Jesus and laying him as the foundation of our personal lives, our home and family, our business, our church, every aspect of our life, our sportsmanship, how we are when we're in traffic, how we are when we're dealing with difficult circumstances or relationships. We want Jesus to be Lord of our life. We want to lay him as the foundation of anything and everything that's being built in our lives. So I wanted to get that back to you because the Lord reminded me of that just moments ago. But when you look at Jesus coming to destroy the works of the devil, and, and I think it's tied together because when we're laying him as foundation, we're knowing his person and we're also knowing his work. Now we're going to get into knowing his teaching and obeying him and knowing his authority and knowing his voice. But here's where we are right now. We're really trying to capture as students and followers, disciples of Jesus Christ, that we are aware of why he came. Listen, if you don't love Jesus in a radical way, it's okay. Don't panic because you simply need a revelation of all he came and accomplished on your behalf. We're talking about here, you know, he came to reintroduce the kingdom, put the spirit of God back in us. Jesus lived, died, rose again, and now lives in you by the Holy Spirit, if you're a born-again Christian. But then he came to destroy the works of the devil. All that fear, guilt, separation, and condemnation, he came to, uh, to destroy it and put it away. So I want to read now Romans chapter 5, verse 14 through 19 again. This is in the Message Bible. And I read this on Sunday. Wow, it's, uh, it is so powerful. I love the way the author just translates this. Uh, let me see. Yes. So death, this huge abyss separating us from God, dominated the landscape from Adam all the way to Moses. Even though, uh, even those who didn't sin precisely as Adam did by disobeying a specific command of God, still had to experience this termination or separation in life. But Adam, who got us into this, all point, also points ahead to the one who's going to get us out of it. Yet the rescuing gift is not exactly parallel to the death-dealing sin. If one man's sin put crowds of people at the dead-end abyss of separation from God, just think what God's gift poured out through the one man Jesus Christ will do. There's no comparison between that death-dealing sin and this generous life-giving gift. You know, I love, this is message, I love the Passion Translation as well, but they're both really emphasizing that whatever Adam's sin did to us, it pales in comparison in the way of power and effect to what Jesus Christ has done to make it right and to set us free from death and separation from the life of God. Oh my goodness. No comparison, he says. The verdict on that one sin was the death sentence. The verdict on the many sins that followed uh, that, that followed was this wonderful life sentence through Jesus Christ. If death got the upper hand through Adam's wrongdoing, can you imagine the breathtaking recovery that life makes, absolute life, in those who grasp with both hands this wildly extravagant gift, this grand setting everything right that the one man, Jesus Christ, has provided. Here it is in a nutshell. Just as one person did it wrong, that's Adam, and got us into this trouble with sin and death, another came and did it right and got us out of it, out of separation and into union. But more than just getting us out of trouble, he got us into life. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong. One man said yes to God and put many in the right. And of course, that's, diso that's one man disobeyed. That was Adam. He heard, but he didn't obey. And then Jesus came and he obeyed perfectly. He heard the voice of his father 
and then he carried it out. You know, everything that Jesus came to do and to restore for us, give us back, has to do with our role here on earth. He came to reconnect us to the life of God. Why? So we can express the life of God. So we can put God on display for all the world to see. You guys know as well as I do that right now in this country, and I believe throughout the whole world, the, the world and people, Americans, whoever, they need to see who God really is in this hour. He comes to make us righteous. He comes to make us holy. He sets us apart unto the, unto the Father. He makes us ambassadors, literal envoys, uh, representatives of who he is and his kingdom. He makes us disciples. He makes us priests again. He makes us kings now. All of those uh, identities are for use here on the earth so that we can put our Father on display, so we can advance God's kingdom one heart at a time, bringing the Spirit of God, the life of God, back to whosoever would receive Him because the price has been paid. All that needed to be done has been done. We've got to quit assigning more value to what Adam did and the enemy in all that fear, separation, guilt, and condemnation then we assign value to Jesus Christ and what he did. It is really about proper value assignment. Do you assign more value and power to your uh, sins, your past, your ability to make a mistake, do a big piece of stupid, or do you put it in the boxing ring up against the blood of God's one and only son and the love of your father and realize, you know what? You know what? As, as, Great as my sin was, my mistake, or that period of my life that I'm so embarrassed or remorseful about, where sin abounded, grace does that much more abound. That's Romans chapter 6, I believe, and uh, verse 20. But we're going to assign more value to the blood of Jesus Christ. We're going to assign more value to our Father's redemptive work and His power than we assign to what uh, the enemy did. All right, let's go to Romans now. Chapter 6, and we'll kind of solidify this. I didn't get into it on Sunday morning. Well, right there, Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. So listen, we've just come out of Romans 5 and the contrast here of Adam and Jesus. But listen to Romans 6, 3. Well, hey, let's start with verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound to us? Because the gift of God's grace, Paul ends Romans 5 by saying, this gift is just so astonishing. By the way, that's Romans 5.20, because I see it right here. I said it's Romans 6.20. It's 5.20, where it says, where sin abounds, grace does that much more abound. But he ends Romans 5 talking about that Christ's gift is greater than the transgression and the effect of Adam's sin. So he starts in verse 1 of, of chapter 6 saying, well, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And he says, God forbid, of course not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Do you not know that as many of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? I've said it many times. See, when he was crucified, you were crucified with him and put to death. Verse 4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death with him uh, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we too now have a brand new life or walk in newness of life. So when Jesus died, you died. What's the execution? What's the punishment for sin? Death. Okay, when he died, he didn't just die for you, he died as you. When he died, you died with him. The old you was righteously justifiably put to death because the wages of sin is death. Now, verse 5, for if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So not only were you crucified with Christ, you were raised with him. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him and our body of sin, that old person I used to be, was done away with that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Why? Because I'm a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. You're not who you used to be. Verse 7, for he who has died has been freed from sin. You have been discharged. It's like Jesus went to court and said, paid in full. It's like Jesus served your time. Jesus paid your penalty. 
It's incredible. I'm going to say it again. We really need a revelation of the magnitude of what Jesus did and what he marvelously accomplished on our behalf so that we'll start living lives connected to our Father again. We'll start living connected to the vine again. That's what needs to happen. Okay, and then uh, verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, then we believe that we'll also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Verse 10, for the death he died, he died to sin once for everybody. John 12, verse 31 through 33, Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. He actually says in verse 31, now is the judgment of this world. See, he judged the world in that respect to sin 2,000 years ago, and he meted out the judgment on his son, Jesus Christ. It's the greatest love story and substitutionary, uh, you know, I'll take your place love story that's ever been told. So when he died, you died, and then the new creation, you, walked out of the tomb in him. And as we'll get into this Sunday, remember in the new covenant, which the five terms are these, I'm going to write my law inside, in your heart and in your mind. I'll be your God, you'll be my people. He says, no man will have to teach his brother, saying, know the Lord, all can know me from the least to the greatest. We're going to do away with hierarchy. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be a certain family. You don't have to be born in the nation of Israel to be in this covenant. Everybody can know me from the least to the greatest. Glory to God. Then he says, your sin and lawless deeds I'll remember no more. So that's the terms of the new covenant, and that covenant is between God and his son, Jesus Christ. So if you're not in Christ, get yourself in Christ. And you say, Brother Steve, how do I get in Christ? You invite him in. It's John 14. He and the Father will come and make their home on the inside of you. And the only reason he can come and live on the inside of you is because he died for you and eradicated your sin. Past, present, and future sin has been cleansed. Listen to what it says again. Verse 10, the death he died, he died to sin once for all. You've already been executed for your sin. So stop living back there. Now, I don't mean that you ignore transgressions in the present tense, because let's be honest, with Christ living on the inside, then then when we misstep, we feel conviction. But you've got to be able to rightfully divide and discern the difference between conviction of the Holy Spirit reminding you, hey, that's not who you are. That's death. That's the old life. That was the old you. We don't, that's not who we are. That's conviction versus condemnation. That's what Jesus came to destroy, that work of the accuser, the slanderer. You are not guilty in the courts of heaven because of what Jesus Christ has done. And and yet, look around in America. How many people are struggling? They they just don't believe they have uh, reconciliation with God. They don't don't see how they've been united to him. And, And the reason is because they live by what they feel. They live by what they see. They live by uh, how they behave instead of living by the truth. And you say, well, Brother Steve, you can't ignore behavior. I agree, but don't start by addressing behavior. Start by addressing belief in the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 says we are sanctified. We become more and more like Christ in action, behavior, and attitude by the work of the Holy Spirit that's in us and by believing the truth. I'm not, I'm not saying don't address people's behavior, but address their belief about themselves. Address their belief in the truth first. Because once you start believing the truth and knowing the truth, Jesus said, partnering with the truth, it'll set you free. It'll liberate you and it'll change your behavior. My goodness, religion is always out to to twist and correct outward behavior. Jesus is coming to fix your heart, fix your motive, and now empower you to, uh, what's, what's the word? Empower you to keep his commands, to choose his choices. That's what I was looking for. He's living on the inside of you. That's what conviction does. Empowers you to choose his choices. See, if you think grace is just a doctrine, then what you think is, oh my goodness, you know, Steve, when when you preach this, that, and the other, you're just saying people can go out and sin. And uh, no, grace is a person. Yes, there's a legal standing in the courtroom of heaven whereby Steve is not guilty. He's in Christ, therefore his slate is clean. My slate, my track record looks like that of Christ. What's in my account is actually from Christ's account. And it's full of righteousness and right standing and fulfillment of the law and every requirement. I mean, it's incredible. But it's him. 
It's him. He's the one who did it. Let me continue on. I kind of got, got excited there. Verse 11. So likewise then. Oh, wait, I didn't finish verse 10. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he now lives unto God. Jesus Christ is still living his life unto God, but he's no longer in the carpenter suit. He's in you and he's in me. So what, what's the work of the Christian life? What's the real work? To believe him, trust him, yield to him, rely upon him, uh, live connected to him as a, as a branch does to a vine, be sourced by him and let him express his life unto God through you and me. Hallelujah. Verse 11, likewise, you also reckon yourselves, consider yourselves, acknowledge yourselves to be dead now to sin. The old you died. Dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. How are we alive unto God? We are in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, I mentioned it, 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, new things have come. And then he goes into verse 18, that the Lord has reconciled us uh, to himself. And that we're so reconciled, the Lord gave us the ministry now of reconciliation. I just beg you on behalf of Christ to grab a hold of the reality that you really have been reconciled. And it was no work of yourself. It was not what you did. It's what he did on your behalf. But you have received it. Therefore, you are in the covenant and receiving those blessed promises that come with it. Again, it's between God and his son, Jesus Christ. So if you're in Christ, you're in the covenant. We're going to talk extensively about this starting on Sunday morning. Verse 12, therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. Don't present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. Present yourselves to God, to God. Don't spend your whole life fighting against sin. Spend your whole life presenting yourself and representing yourself unto the Lord as being alive from the dead. Man, again, I'm not after your behavior. I'm after your belief in the truth that determines your behavior. Present yourself on a regular basis as alive unto God, alive from the dead, and present your members as instruments now of righteousness to God. So you tell the devil, you shut, tell, tell the devil, shut up, devil. I'm not yielding my body as instruments to disobedience and unrighteousness. I've been bought with a price. I'm a brand new person. I'm a brand new creation. I'm yielding now the members of my body, my mind, all those things, which are the Lord's now because he bought them. But I'm yielding all of myself to him as instruments of righteousness. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under law. You are under grace. And let me say again, grace is not just some doctrine. Grace is a person. You can read it in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. There's your homework for this week. The grace of God appeared and he teaches us to deny ungodliness. So grace is a person. Anyway, guys, I wanted to share that with you uh, tonight. I pray that blesses you. Jesus Christ came to destroy those works of the devil. Your emotions are real, but they are not reliable. And so when you start feeling accused and belittled, rejected, you start having feelings of, well, I'm not really forgiven. I'm not really clean. I'm not really righteous. Uh, you have feelings of guilt and shame and condemnation. You put the devil underneath your feet where he belongs because Christ is in you. So the devil we know is under Christ's feet. That was prophesied all the way back in Genesis. He's done it at the cross. He put the devil underneath his feet and then rose from the dead. Christ is in you. So the devil thereby is underneath your feet. And you tell him you are a liar. You are a deceiver. You're a false accuser. In Christ, I've been made right. And because of that, when I stumble, I'm going to get up and I'm going to keep going again. I'm going to take God his word. Uh, word. I'm going to get back to the truth and live the life that he has destined me and lovingly created me to live. Guys, you're too great a creation to be satisfied by sin. Only the Spirit of God can satisfy you. I think the real deception of sin that gets us, uh, you know, the enemy likes to trick us and deceive us into it. But the real trick and deception of sin is that it could ever satisfy you. It can't. Only the one who made you can satisfy you. Father, I pray tonight, uh, Lord, for great breakthrough for those of us here walking uh, with you at Grace Church and then beyond Grace Church. Lord, all of us who have ears to hear, I pray for a great breakthrough. There is a time that is coming, and I believe is yet now here, 
when people who call your name, who say, hey, I am yours, Jesus, and you are mine, that we turn from the ways of the world, we come out of the wickedness, we come out of the systematic thinking, the human uh, humanism that dominates the culture, and Lord, we cling to you, we cling to the truth. I pray, Lord, for breakthrough tonight that by revelation, people begin to see the magnitude of what you accomplished. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.